Welcome everyone to Vivo 5G Talk. My name is Rakesh Tamrakar and I am a leading specialist at Vivo Communications Research Institute. In today's event, we will explore the state of 5G in Asia and its potential to transform and improve society. We are fortunate to have with us six industry experts who will share their thoughts about the fascinating world of mobile communications and 5G technology in the region. Let me briefly introduce our guest speakers. First, we have Niraj Busal. Niraj is an IT professional who has proudly served the government of Nepal since 2013. Throughout his career, he's worked on several fascinating projects, including Digital Nepal Framework, Nagrik App, and Cabinet Automation System, just to name a few. Second, we have Mohammed Adil Israr, the Chief Technology and Enterprise Business Officer of NCL Exiata in Nepal and lead uh, CTO group operation at Exiata. Next, we have Minu Pradhan, a manager at Nepal Telecom's 5G Communications Department, a local telecommunications service provider. Then we have Pervez Iftikar, an international consultant on ICT policy and regulations. Pervez advises governments, telecom administrations, and regulators in developing uh, economies. Our fifth speaker is Khalid Khan, founder of uh, Central Asian uh, Cellular Forum. With over 30 years in, of experience, Khalid is known for his commitment to the promotion of IT, telecom, and media, especially in the developing countries. Last, but certainly not least, we have Asif Aziz, Chief ja uh, Business Officer at Jazz, Pakistan's leading mobile operator and digital company. Now, before we dive into the discussion, let me give you a bit of background on Vivo's efforts in 5G and introduce our theme for today. At Vivo, we strive to bring you a boundless intelligent world through ICT. To this end, by focusing on state-of-art consumer technologies, including 5G, we are building bridges between humans and digital world. In other words, we put a lot of efforts into making 5G smartphones more convenient and accessible for consumers. Our powerful X and V series, for instance, offer some of the slimmest 5G phones in the market thanks to our 3G stacking technology. These phones also come with excellent power saving features and incredible reli uh, reliable community, uh, connectivity, all backed by years of R&D. With over 100 uh, global standard experts working on 5G research, we are committed to enabling a seamless 5G experience for all our consumers worldwide. As of today, Vivo is one of the leading standalone smartphone contributors to 3GPP standards with more than 10,000 5G pro proposals and about 5,000 5G invention patents. However, it's not just about numbers and specification, but about the impact we have on human lives through our technology. As a reason experiencing robust growth, Asia is yet to fully benefit from deployment of 5G. Our sector is making huge strides towards making 5G a reality for consumers. And I hope today's discussion offers a glimpse of what lies ahead for this vibrant region and its digital transformation. With that, uh, let's welcome our first uh, guest speaker, uh, Mohammed Abdil Israr. Mohammed, uh, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much. So uh, I'll just keep it uh, very brief. So uh, what we need to, from a perspective of uh, 5G uh, is uh, mainly the need of, uh, you know, higher data throughputs uh, and higher data speeds, which otherwise will not be able to offer into a 4G environment. And uh, what basically we are seeing itself is that uh, uh, the point where uh, 5G is, is, is taking up uh, in certain applications and, areas is that either number one, it's uh, 
it's a, it's a replacement to an FTTX because in certain environments, uh, it makes a lot of relevance uh, uh, because of the cost to deploy cables. And at the second time itself, it's, it's also enabling and uh, uh, evolving around certain industry applications, which is helping us around uh, you know digital innovation in the field of IoT and all of those things as well. So uh, definitely uh, looking at how the uh, growth and everything is happening, 5G is something that is uh, needed for uh, our digital growth of the industry. And we being uh, one of the main participant uh, and the leading telecom operator in Nepal, uh, part of Exiata Group, which is uh, uh, working in 10 countries across Asia. Uh, certainly we we are uh, very much into, uh, you know, bringing this uh, leapfrog technology into this country. So uh, basically the need of 5G, as I said correctly, is uh, more around the applications that require uh, intense latency, mission critical applications. And at the same time, it can possibly, and in the around the world, uh, in some of our markets, we are also seeing this to be a replacement of an FTTX because uh, otherwise FTTX is not viable in, in some of the environments. Uh, what is the current status we are seeing? And as I said in my uh, uh, previous presentation around the world, uh, a lot of operators are now focusing because on uh, EMBB uh, on a small screen, uh, uh, unless and until the requirements are not really going critical, uh, uh, 4G is pretty much taking care of an EMBB need, but uh, on uh, more of the evolution around FWA and 5G is a key use case. And uh, you can see in the map, there are a lot of countries around the world in, uh, uh, in developing countries as well as in developed countries that have actually used uh, 5G FWA to actually bridge the uh, digital gap approx. So, Coming back to the uh, situation in Nepal, uh, we see the uh, the small screen uh, usage per uh, uh, user at this point of time is staying around four gig, uh, and around uh, ninety five percent of people are using uh, small uh, devices, small screen handsets, mainly primarily the the, the mobile phones, and uh, with the ecosystem which is currently hovering around, the average speeds required for those users are not more than. 3 Mbps. And if you see the breakup, uh, and that's the latest intelligence report that we are giving uh, uh, from the Nepal statistics, uh, most of the users are either into streaming, uh, they're doing web pricing and, and file, file access as well. Whereas all those critical mission critical application that may require 5G immediately, that is not uh, the norm uh, across the people and people are not usually using it. Uh, so the way we see 5G uh, coming up in Nepal, uh, there are a couple of applications that we think about it. Uh, this country being a landlocked country, having uh, more than 40% of area in mid hills and mountains, uh, uh, there will be a probable case of bringing 5G in the form of an FWA uh, first, together with EMBB, because EMBB uh, still we have uh, less than 7% of handset penetration in this market at this current stage. And the user maturity has not reached to, to a point where actually uh, you would consider that to be leapfrog immediately within uh, three to six months of horizon. Uh, but the challenges that we see, uh, the country itself, uh, economy has not significantly grown. Uh, They're still coming out of the impacts of pandemic, uh, countries opening up. Uh, the per capita income is also playing an important part and we looking at even uh, 5G CPE, the cost is hovering around the uh, $250. And on the other hand, uh, uh, players like uh, Vivo, as you mentioned, you guys uh, need to work on uh, uh, the, the adoption of 5G handsets because currently the penetration of 5G supported handsets is very low. And one of the barriers in the market is the price point because still uh, the 5G handsets are uh, uh, you know, beyond the affordability of 60% of the population. Uh, and one of the challenges that we also see from a perspective of uh, Nepal is that uh, the telecom market revenues are shrinking um, uh, thanks to the liberalization that has happened over the years where ISPs are having a lot of aggression. Uh, from a business case standpoint, uh, we see that uh, 5G is something that we see in the near horizon somewhere between end of 2024 or early 2025. But having said that, there are a lot of preparations, there's a lot of work that needs to be done and uh, uh, we are embarking on those preparation journey. Uh, spectrum wise, what we see for Nepal, uh, uh, thankfully, uh, in absence of a UHF, entire 700 band is free, uh, which is uh, a critical uh, requirement for uh, 
uh, deep indoor and as well as rural pe uh, penetration. And at the same time, we are seeing uh, uh, band 40, band 41, as well as uh, the, the C band, which is sub six gigahertz spectrum. Uh, that will primarily be driven uh, for uh, for uh, the adoption of 5G across the country. When we just uh, uh, see from a, a handset snapshot perspective, uh, we see that uh, uh, these bands naturally are the ones which are actually being supported by the, uh, the supporting handsets, and that's the latest data that we picked up from GSA. Uh, so basically, it's uh, it's C band band forty one, which is twenty six hundred band forty twenty three hundred, and N twenty eight, which is uh, 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 seven hundred, are the leading uh, you know uh, bands uh, that will primarily drive uh, a lot of adoption into uh, these particular bands itself for for launching five G in our market. Uh, recommendation wise, what we see uh, uh, with the spectrum usage that we have in hand. We see somewhere uh, spectrum will get to a saturation point, as I said, uh, end of 2024. Uh, so whatever the spectrum that we hold in hand uh, to have this 4G and 4G plus in the market will also be exhausted in, in a period of one, one and a half year from now. So it's very inevitable to, to, to start working on uh, uh, coming up with the framework. Uh, the fact remains is that uh, we are committed to uh, to the earlier adoption of 5G in this country, and we are committed uh, based on our experience in different markets. Uh, uh, for example, in Malaysia, we already a 5G operator. Um, uh, but so far, uh, we have not been able to give, uh, have, have, have received the permission to, to do the 5G trial, despite we have applied it six months ago. So what we see from a perspective of Nepal uh, market traffic adoption and growth in fact, with the current spectrum holdings in 4G, uh, we see that if we don't do anything in a uh, year of uh, one year now, uh, we would see start second choking. And this will actually certainly push us, the operators, to, to start investing more heavily in uh, providing capacities, which will definitely, with this uh, uh, declining APU and uh, declining revenue markets, would be difficult for the operators to, to adopt for. So uh, that's pretty much uh, we uh, believe from our side uh, would be the key. And uh, we are uh, at the crossroads of, you know, an early adoption of 5G because we see people progressing. So not only from a market readiness perspective, uh, there are three levers that everybody has to work. One is the handset penetration. Uh, affordability on handsets is the key because this market is uh, uh, per capita income wise, one of the poorest country. Um, the second adoption that is required is uh, is to start doing the preparation because from a um, uh, uh, capacity perspective that we are providing to the user and the steady state growth that we are seeing in data. Um, in a year or half, uh, this will also be a challenge. And this will be the right sweet spot to, to go and uh, talk about 5G launch uh, to happen in Nepal. And uh, last but not the least is uh, perhaps uh, since the main application in Nepal would be around extreme mobile broadband, um, there is no user or new market that needs to be established. Uh, that will be the existing users or market. And I think 90% of the world, everybody is serving 5G use case around uh, EMBB alone. Uh, our uh, request and appeal would be from a regulatory standpoint that 5G spectrum pricing should be rationalized in accordance with that, because this is not a new frontier or new market that we're establishing. We have to serve the existing population and that existing population uh, would not be giving a lot of incremental revenue, uh, especially in a situation and uh, context of uh, declining APUs and uh, economies growth uh, stagnant at that level. Uh, with this, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude my presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed, uh, for your brilliant insights. Uh, so now I would like to welcome uh, Pervez Iftikar. Pervez, welcome. What I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll just uh, uh, narrate the, the small story of 5G in, in Pakistan. Pakistan. Uh, oh, the initiative uh, so far that has been taken and the challenges uh, that we face uh, in, in the country right now. Uh, So uh, globally, we all know that uh, 5G uh, is happening uh, ar around the world. 
uh, at places it has been introduced, at places it is uh, still in its infancy. Uh, uh, the smartphones are also coming up. And uh, uh, of course, uh, there are over a billion connections. Uh, in Pakistan, we have uh, so far had trials uh, of uh, 5G only. Um, and uh, all the four MNOs, the mobile network operators, have uh, carried out these trials successfully as it is being claimed. Uh, the initiative for 5G was taken in Pakistan by the uh, IT minister. Uh, the current IT minister was also the IT minister uh, of the previous government, uh, incidentally, and he uh, announced that we will have uh, uh, 5G uh, by the beginning of 23, which is now, uh, around now, this time. Uh, a, a, a committee was formed by him uh, back in third on third third January 2020. Uh, the so-called advisory committee for 5G planning in Pakistan. I happened to be a part of that. Its first meeting was held in, in on 25th February, and then of course subsequently some other meetings were held. Later on, the World Bank also offered help. I mean, this was not uh, one of those uh, World Bank projects where they give loan and that has to be repaid. This was a kind of a free of charge technical assistance that they offered. So they started working on it as well. <clears throat> uh, in March 21, almost a year later, they came up with a, with a report uh, uh, or, as, or a discussion draft, as they like to call it. Uh, which was a 5G readiness plan for Pakistan. It was quite a comprehensive document, 124 pages. Its main author was uh, uh, Scott Minin from Australia, uh, a well-known consultant. Uh, he held uh, lots of discussions with the stakeholders uh, in the country, but unfortunately, all those uh, discussions had to be uh, done remotely because it was not possible to come to Pakistan or to any country because of COVID restrictions uh, in Australia. So anyhow, this, this discussion uh, uh, draft was widely discussed. And what the telecom wing of the Ministry of IT did was to uh, have their own consultations, stakeholders' consultations, and come up with, a, uh, with another uh, uh, draft policy guidelines, uh, which they called 5G strategic plan and policy guidelines. But this was also um, uh, supposed to be a, a draft. Uh, incidentally, its, may, its recommendations were very interesting because some of them were addressing the government itself. For example, uh, it recommended that the uh, spectrum auction should be investment friendly, which of course means lower prices and uh, easier payment terms. Uh, it uh, recommended duty-free network equipment for 5G. Uh, it, it also recommended uh, similar uh, 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 rebates and zero duties on the smartphones and components and IoT devices. It also recommended a review of the right-of-way policy. Basically, this was uh, intended for the optic fiber cables, but uh, very important because uh, the penetration is low in the country. And uh, then uh, refarming framework of the spectrum. Uh, this has been done partly. The 1800 band, uh, 1800 megahertz band has been reformed, and uh, but the 900 is still to be done. Uh, but th this was one of the recommendations of this committee, uh, allowing spectrum trading and sharing. Uh, this is allowed in the policy, in the previous policy, which is still valid, but uh, the framework is missing. So they they pushed for that, and of course uh, they wanted on, wanted to push the. Uh, local assembly and production of the uh, de devices in the country. So these are some of the recommendations, not all of them, but the main ones. Uh, meanwhile, the, metro, uh, the mobile network operators were uh, pointing at challenges, and rightly so, not uh, that they are making up these things. They said the penetration of 4G is too low in the country. So according to this uh, PT annual report that I saw, the regulator's annual report of uh, in, in uh, the present, uh, uh, sorry, the last year's report, uh, in September 22, there was 49% uh, uh, 4G subscriptions uh, uh, of the total mobile broadband subscriptions. So this is, uh, of course, now across 50%, but this is still too low. Um, then the optic fiber cables, uh, again, uh, September 22, it was... Uh, that 11% of the uh, towers were connected with optic fibers. Uh, of course, 5G needs uh, big data pipes, read optic fiber cables, and uh, the penetration, as, as you can see, 11% is not very good. Uh, 
the telecom sector players financial health is not very good uh, the arpu is among the lowest in the world uh, currently uh, um, according to the pta website it is 232 rupees which is about 80 cents which is uh, as i said currently it's it's one of the lowest in the world uh, the regulatory payments especially the spectrum fees are rising because the spectrum fees are pegged to the us dollar now, uh, whenever the rupee depreciates uh, as against dollar, the payments rise. So this is a continuous battle and the payments are rising uh, continuously uh, without the government ever having to raise them uh, in, in rupee terms. So this is a very big challenge for the, for the operators. And of course, the customs and duties are one of the highest in the world as far as uh, the, the, the taxes and all kinds of custom duties. So one of the highest in the world in Pakistan. I'm talking of the duties on the uh, telecommunications equipment. Uh, then the, there are, as, as, as mentioned by the previous speaker, Mohammed Adil, also the 5G handset uh, availability and affordability uh, is an issue. Uh, although uh, it is claimed that 700 models are now available, but uh, it still remains, uh, especially from the affordability point of view, uh, the market is quite price sensitive and this is a big issue. Uh, the, the, then the digital ecosystem in the country is not so developed. I mean, all the uh, elements like e-commerce, cloud computing, IoT, blockchain, etc., they're all in the early years, not infancy perhaps, but very early years. So that also has an impact on the uh, on the launching or not launching of 5G. And of course, there is no 5G policy as yet, especially on 5G spectrum. This uh, is something which is, uh, which is something which is, uh, I think required, uh, the, the, should be the first step towards uh, going to the adoption of 5G. So the general consensus is that the challenges are huge, of course. Uh, I just give you two examples of the infrastructure, which I mentioned in the previous slides. Uh, the 11% towers connected to uh, to um, uh, connected with optic fibers is one of the lowest in the uh, in similar countries. So uh, that needs to be addressed at, at a quick pace somehow. And of course, the spectrum. I also mentioned this earlier that uh, the spectrum allocated to the mobile network operators in Pakistan is one of the lowest. This slide is slightly old, as you can see, 2021, but nothing much has changed. I mean, they, of course, there, there are more spectrum issued even in Pakistan, but the overall picture remains more or less the same. So while all these discussions were continuing uh, uh, last year, so, uh, this time of, the, of last year, uh, somehow the country, as you may be reading in the newspapers and hearing in television, uh, country went through, uh, got embroiled in some kind, some um, political, economical challenging situation, which is unprecedented. And therefore, uh, nothing much has happened in the previous, uh, previous 12 months or so. So last slide, uh, my own thoughts of how, what we should do and what we need to do is that the government and PTA uh, and I've been discussing this and I've been uh, saying this to my colleagues in the government and the PTA that the 5G policy uh, should be, uh, should be uh, uh, formulated as soon as possible, but not giving any committed 5G launch date. Let that, let that remain as it is. Don't mention any date, but come up with a 5G policy. Then auction spectrum, which should be technology neutral, which means it should be reusable by the MNOs for 4G is not not just 5G only, large contiguous blocks, which are the, which is a requirement of 5G, uh, low prices, easier payment of terms, and of course lower the customs duties or taxes on the 4G and 5G related infrastructure equipment, optic fiber cables, kits for the smartphones, and things like that. All, all those which help, uh, which which impact 4G and 5G uh, layout. Uh, the network operators taking advantage of these, uh, if I may call them concessions, uh, initially they should focus on increasing 4G deployment and adoption because that is, uh, that is their complaint also and that is also a requirement uh, that uh, we should have more, uh, uh, the, the, the percentage of mobile, band, uh, mobile broadband uh, subscriptions in 4G should become, should cross maybe 75-80%. 
And uh, at the same time, in order to help uh, indigenous use cases, uh, we need to have 5G hotspots for universities and research organizations. And let the market take care of the timing of the 5G launch. Uh, I agree with the previous speaker that uh, maybe we should expect that in 12 months, maybe four to 18 months, but to force the industry to come up with the, a firm date uh, may not be the best policy. Let the market decide. Uh, as I wrote in my newspaper article very recently, the challenges are uh, huge, but not insurmountable. We have to work for them. And during this time, instead of giving dates and instead of saying we should have or not, not have, let us, let us start preparing for them. Start preparing for 5G. I thank you very much. Very inspiring, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now let's hear from uh, Asif Aziz. Let me just uh, explain a little bit about uh, uh, Pakistan as well for those people who are not familiar. A huge country, 227 million population, very large youth population, and getting into the digital economy. Literacy rate could be better at 63%, but 21% uh, only have a bank account. The GDP isn't great, it's at 378 billion, and a lot of it is done by uh, some of the foreign remittances. Um, the country is expansive. It borders from China, India, Afghanistan, Iran, so and has a seaport in the south and is managed by a number of provinces. Within the market itself, 194 million subscribers, so 86% penetration has been achieved. Unfortunately, on that, as uh, Mr. Pervez Iftikhar just shared, digital penetration is still low at 127 million internet users as according to the PTA reports, of which 110 million are 4G. So less than half uh, of the country is using it and of the population penetration, it's 56%. Smartphone penetration has been rising, but in the recent years, and I mean the last 18 months, it has slowed down uh, quite substantially. And I'll cover as to why that has happened. Social media is prolific. Uh, 72 million of the users in the country are using social media. Jazz has a very ambitious uh, project here in terms of what we want to be. We want to be a digital partner of the future for our customers. We go beyond just the access connectivity of providing voice and data. We have a number of apps that have been built in-house here in the country. The Masha, our entertainment app, is one of the largest entertainment apps in the country right now. Um, we are monitoring it. Jazz World, our own app, has become a super app. It's not just a self-care platform, but there are discounts. It's integrated with entertainment and it's integrated with um, uh, Islamic services as well. And is one of the biggest used local apps as well. We also have Bajao, BIP. We recently launched a partnership with Turkcell and we brought in our own social messaging platform as well. So we are just not just a mobile operator, but we have this as well. And of course it wouldn't be uh, justice if I didn't talk about our Jazz Cash product, which is the largest mobile wallet service in the country right now, with over 14 million users using access to Jazz Cash every single day. So a lot of consumers are spending time online. But I am going to just concur with the previous speaker. The challenge we have today is Pakistan needs more 4G before we can start providing 5G for a few. The penetration of 4G, as you can see, according to that graph, has decelerated in 22 and 23. And I'm embarrassed to, to share with you that I'm selling more 2G today than 4G. And there is a real reason for that. The taxation on these handsets is so high that actually people cannot afford it. So the taxation that the government has implemented on phones that are bought into the country or that are bought used within the country is so high that actually people are going back to 2G services because of affordability. We've invested a considerable amount, but still far too many people do not use 4G. And uh, as Mr. Tikar also shared, 
fiberization, I've got it around 10%. I think it was 11% in his presentation, but only 90% uh, plus of our network is not connected to fiber. So backhaul will be a real challenge. And then when I look at the 5G handset penetration, well, that's less than 1% of the handsets. Very typical, taxation on a high-end device can be as much as the cost of the device itself. So in some cases, uh, an iPhone um, can have um, about $1,000 worth of taxation on the device. So if the handset costs you $1,000, you'll have to probably pay another $1,000 in taxation. So people are not opting for these high-end devices. If I just talk about the use cases, what people are doing, and I put this on a very simple matrix, just I was trying to understand it for myself as well. What is relevant in Pakistan on one scale? And what can be done on 4G and what probably requires 5G? Right now, most of my customers are using streaming. Some are making video calling, a little bit of e-commerce through our Jazz Cash, and of course, the OTT platforms that we have here, such as the Masha, Bajau, our TV and music. And we have got other third-party applications in the country as well from international brands. Most of that can be done on 4G. What will then require some of the 5G technologies, 3D video calling, immersive gaming, you know, automated vehicles, driverless cars. I don't think these things are relevant in the country today. From where I sit in my position as a sea level of a the world of Pakistan's largest mobile operator, I cannot see these things coming into the market uh, in the next immediate time frame. Certainly not the ambitious one that we had where 5G would have been launched this year. What we have done is we've been trialing this. And Mr. Vsakar very correctly said, noticed that we should be working with, industry, with, uh, with educational establishments. We've established a 5G innovation lab at the local university here in Islamabad. And we'll be working to fiberize our towers. So 5G, we have deployed, we have tested, we are ready for it. But we're, we're unable to proceed because the use cases are not quite there. And internally, our data penetration is lagging behind. Now I really come to what uh, I really need. I think Professor uh, Tagar Saab was very generous in talking about subsidized. No, I need free assignment of 5G spectrum. The current spectrum is pegged to the dollar. Through no fault of mine, no fault of mine whatsoever, my spectrum prices have more than increased by 100% in the last one year alone. My revenue has not grown 100% because I collect in PKR. I cannot push that onto our poor consumers, which is why our re revenue is at $80 cents. Of course, it would have been at $2 cents only two years ago. Of course, I can try to double prices to six, 700 rupees. That will cause more angst to our consumers. We've got uh, import restrictions in the country right now because of the uh, control on outflows of um, foreign exchange. I would suggest zero import taxes on 5G and 5G equipment because these things will be enablers for the country to boost the economy. There should be uh, lower taxation on the higher end devices. Whilst it may sound counterintuitive, I think we need to increase taxation on the 2G devices so that we restrict the entry of 2G and we get everybody to get onto 4G. With 4G penetration at about 55%, this needs to reach 80% very quickly for us to be able to build a credible perspective of providing 5G. I need a government support on this one. I cannot work without our bureaucracies for specific use cases to be built in country, IoT, driverless cars, any other remote work that can be undertaken. I think it requires a lot of work. Our financial health has been discussed. We are in, um, we are in, a, we are in an emergency. Um, interest rates went up another one percentage points, which wiped off significant amounts of our profit. Energy costs are going through the roof. Uh, my spectrum fees are linked to the dollar. Our returns are now squeezed to the point of no longer being viable entities. There has been emphasis on local production of smartphones, which was a great initiative by the government. But since the restriction of the imports, 
the components could no longer come into the country. So therefore, handset production has also stopped. I would also go one step further, and I would make it a policy statement that no local produced phone can be 2G or 3G, has to be 4G only. Too many people are still making 2G phones and flooding the market with these very cheap three, four dollar, five dollar phones and consumers are adopting them. We do need to have the right of way and other discussions that were mentioned earlier on to help us accelerate our fiberization. I am looking at this audience now and encouraging people to view this from the lens which, which I look at it, which is this is nothing short but a broadband emergency in the market. Um, the incumbent players are struggling to stay alive with punitive policies that have been put in place is making it very difficult for us to build a viable 5G uh, business case right now. We need significant support in order to move forward. And I think um, putting on an arbitrary date to me that says by January 2024, you will have launched 5G doesn't help. What I do like is a dialogue and I need to be consulted and I need to be involved in any policy decision making. And I, I urge on all people uh, observing this to take uh, what I'm asking uh, with some seriousness, because I actually think 5G can unlock significant economic value for the country with 220 million people, more of them on data. I think we are on the precipice of being able to find significant new revenue growths, not just for consumers, for businesses, but for the government as well. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your ex expertise with us. At Vivo, we are eager to contribute to the de development of next generation of connectivity in the region. Telecommunication technology is certainly advancing at unprecedented speed, providing greater opportunities for innovative products. I want to continue by welcoming Khalid Khan. Welcome, Khalid. Thank you, um, thank you, Rakesh. Um, uh, it's good to hear, uh, you know, my uh, colleagues from the industry speaking on. In fact, everything that I I wanted to speak on <laughs> actually so left nothing for me to add on, even. Uh, but it's uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, being a technologist, it's always uh, you know important for us to move forward. Uh, the the biggest crime uh, in a technology industry today is the status quo. Uh, so, you know, uh, we need to uh, see how we can move ahead with technology. Uh, um, I've been instrumental in uh, putting up the first 2G network, and then we were pushing for 3G, uh, and now, uh, and 4G, and of course, uh, 5G is very close to our heart, because uh, with all the challenges that uh, my colleague Parvez and uh, Asif Aziz has mentioned, we still need to move forward, uh, because uh, the consumer... Uh, some of them, maybe not all 100%, but they do deserve to reap the benefits of technology. Now, how do we uh, address that issue is a separate uh, thing. Uh, from a local perspective, uh, Parvez and Asif Aziz are very, uh, uh, in very detail, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, address all those aspects. Uh, two things that really uh, are very important to uh, Pakistan and probably countries like us, Pakistan in the region, is that uh, we are also uh, exporters of, and our main export is going to be uh, human capital. Uh, so, uh, so my uh, my uh, my uh, case for 5G, uh, and we need to move forward with this. Uh, that uh, for a very long time uh, we uh, were late in adopting 3G and 4G. In fact, we were late by almost eight years, and the, the world has moved forward. Uh, so, uh, you know, our engineering uh, human resource became obsolete and they were not easily employable uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the globe. So one of the reasons I always advocate that we also need to adopt technology is because um, our main uh, export is a human resource and we need to have some sort of uh, technology uh, at the front 
so that you know people get trained and then they could be easily employable uh, we produce something like 25 to 30000 people in it and telecom every year we produce that uh, so that's a commodity export the other thing that we do uh, there's a lot of emphasis uh, in pakistan is we are a major exporter or i would not say major but a substantial exporter of it services from when it comes to uh, the share of gdp in pakistan we do export something around 2 2 billion dollar of uh, it services and some of them uh, are in the reign where uh, it involves iot vr xr and all those kind of services that run really uh, good on uh, these networks so that's another case why we need to have 5g in the country and that's the local perspective that we need to keep in mind uh, uh, and the challenges of course uh, i agree with uh, both my colleagues in the industry uh, that uh, for a very long time uh, we have these issues of economic uh, you know um, thing that the spectrum has been unfortunately pegged at a very high price and uh, and the, and that's that's probably the benchmark that we have set uh, the government has set uh, and we need to move out of that mindset uh, to ensure that the it, it's it's easier for the mobile network operators to uh, you know to get the spectrum and not only to get a spectrum but enough spectrum uh, should be there uh, you know to uh, to to have a reasonable 5g network actually because if you are going to give a smaller spectrum then there's no difference between a 4g network and a 5g network uh, so it's very important that uh, you know enough spectrum is provided uh, for any kind of deployment in pakistan to get the kind of uh, uh, the uh, i would say consumer experience or the, uh, the 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 network that we can build on top of that so that's one thing the other thing that we need to also do is to look at the whole uh, uh, industry in totality uh, we just cannot have uh, you know just a spectrum given to 5g and say that it would fly on its own we also have to uh, do fiberization of the country uh, because then the backhauling and all those things have to happen we also need to look at the wifi spectrum uh, because uh, all these uh, next generation uh, application are going to be developed based on uh, the newer wi Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 6E and Wi-Fi 7. So those kind of, uh, you know, spectrum allocation, uh, which is generally free, it doesn't get any money for the government, also needs to be taken uh, into account. So uh, so those are the things that we need to address. And I, uh, I, I fully uh, agree with my colleagues from the industry that uh, there has to be out of the box kind of solution where either the government give them spectrum free of cost for initial five years or three years uh, or they should be given some license which is free of cost for at least the first big 10 cities uh, we do expect you know because when networks roll out uh, the the major cities from where the uh, uh, the, the money comes in uh, to offset uh, you know the rollout in the rural areas uh, th that that could be another possibility uh, there could be other, uh, you know, uh, possibilities, uh, but the government mindset has to be there uh, to, uh, you know, to to address this. And as Asif said, uh, they need to talk to the mobile network operators and address those issues. Uh, taxation obviously uh, has been a, a major hindrance in uh, technology, uh, you know, uh, rolling out uh, to different parts of the country, uh, especially in the rural areas. So uh, we do have mechanism like the USF, but that's very little actually. Uh, uh, the government needs to do more. Uh, so those are the things that I would really like, uh, you know, uh, and agree with my colleagues uh, in the industry. Uh, uh, but as a as a as a as a as a as a, as a, as a closing point, I would still say that we need to look at the entire connectivity issue in totality. Uh, that also do the fiberization, the Wi-Fi. Uh, the taxation and all this needs to be uh, done and we should have a short long term and a medium term plan to do that uh, because we need to take the industry with us to uh, get the uh, consumer the benefit of new technologies. Uh, so I would close at that because uh, before me, my colleagues have really uh, articulated on the subject and the local perspective. So I hope that completes the picture uh, from uh, Pakistan and uh, it would be good to hear our other colleagues from uh, Nepal. Uh, to hear them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for very powerful words of wisdom. Thank you, Khalid. So now uh, let's welcome Niraz Vusal. Uh, 
So thank you so much for this. Uh, so I am Niraj Basal from Nepal and currently studying uh, in China, Wuhan, China. So uh, as a final student with my topic uh, as 5G, uh, which is, uh, as, and to be more specific, uh, my topic is antenna selection uh, in 5G, Messi Mimo. So I think uh, we have talked more about 5G and all the technological aspects in the beginning, and I think everything is covered, but as an academician, I want to just make a, I want to go to a, a generalized way of what 5G is. And before going to what 5G is, so it's a 40 year journey from 1G to uh, 5G now. So we started and then we went to uh, 2G. So which was, which, which introduced digital technology with uh, text messages and data transmission all. So after that, we got uh, 3G in 2000. So we introduced uh, CDMA technology, UMTS technology, and we got the mobile internet uh, services for the first time. So when we were in 2G, we used to get the E or GPS logo. If we remember, we were using the uh, normal bar phones, uh, normal Nokia phones. So we used to get that connections of E and 2G with just basic browsing, web browsing using the default phone browser app. So in 2010, so everything changed to uh, 4G, which brought uh, technologies like LTE, VOLTE. So when we went to the generation of social media, so video streaming platform, gaming platform, so where we got high data speeds and all. So currently we are in the area of 5G. Uh, so so luckily since I am in China, so I am getting to the taste of 5G, so which is not available in country, uh, my, my country, Nepal. So uh, to understand 5G in short, 5G is expected to have ultra, expected or 5G is having ultra high data speed, uh, which introduces technologies like millimeter wave, sub six giga technology, which uh, supports, uh, which, make, which is an ecosystem for IoT, AR, PR, and autonomous driving thing. So I already talked about this. So to understand 5G in general way, so 5G is a wireless technology. Uh, that introduces faster data transfer, uh, low latency, and improved network reliability. So 5G is basically built on three core pillars. So we already discussed earlier. So it is ultra enhanced, uh, enhanced mobile broadband, uh, and ultra reliable low latency URL LLC and machine, uh, machine, uh, machine type communications. So uh, before we are going to uh, to a new generation or updating, so there there always there is always a comparison between what is what the past was and what the future present is going to be. So comparing 4G with 5G, we have numerous benefits. And to sum up, I have made some points here. So as 4G was basically uh, uh, focusing on faster mobile broadband than 5G, so 5G is basically aiming to be a more capable and unified platform. So with 5G, you can expect uh, uh, high data speed of up to 20 Gbps. That is the peak data speed. And the average data speed is uh, 100 Mbps. So when I see social media, mostly I see people when they just give, uh, get uh, 5G, the first thing they do is the make a speed test and post it in the social media. So some are uh, posting that the 5G was uh, promised to give us one Gbps plus data speed. So that's because that's the peak data rates and the current data speeds we are getting is the average data rates. So the another benefit of having 5G is uh, low latency. So 5G, uh, so comparing 4G and 5G, the latency is expected to have a 10x decrease from 10 uh, some, from 100 to 4 and 40 to 1 uh, milliseconds. So another one is the use, use of spectrum, which was already talked by our speakers. You know, so 5G is expected. Uh, 5G support supported. Uh, uh, uh like uh, low bands from one gigahertz to six gigahertz and uh, and the high, high bands uh, known as millimeter waves and also 5g enables the deployment of new technologies like iot support for the ar augmented reality virtual reality uh, and safely driving technology autonomous driving technology and more so this is the data i got i think we have already discussed about the 5g status uh today so currently, uh, we have 5G in uh, all the leading countries, uh, including China, US, and, and other countries. And recently, India also has launched the 5G, and which, uh, which covers more than uh, uh, 108 plus cities in India. So the current status of 5G is that 5G has been deployed by 200 plus uh, operators globally, and 285 plus additional operators are in, in, are in the 5G connections. 
So we have uh, 1 billion plus 5G connections uh, currently. So I think this data says that we will be having connections, 1 billion plus connections by 2023, but we have uh, 1 billion plus connections in 2022. Since recently, I got data from China. It says that in China, we have more than 1 billion plus 5G users by the end of 2022, including all the leading telecom companies, which include China Mobile, China Unicom, and um, China Telecom. So when 5G comes, uh, the most thing, most important thing uh, that we get is the smartphone because the smartphone is one of the uh, easiest device that that get the taste of 5G. So 5G uh, smartphone shipments is, uh, uh, was more than 700 million plus uh, shipments in 2022, and the shipment is expected to be uh, growing more. Even we have many challenges of 5G uh, shipments uh, in my country also, and this currently the economic crisis and the recession. But the uh, smartphone shipment, 5G smartphone shipment is expected to have more than 3.8 uh, billion plus shipments. So on during my study period and my research, I found that uh, these are the uh, key trends in 5G, uh, key trends of 5G in 2023. So basically when you talk about speed and all, so the first thing comes is the standalone 5G. So most of the telecom companies and the countries Currently, they have the non-standalone 5G, so which means that we are using the current infrastructure used by the 4G infrastructure. So mostly, uh, I think that the telecom companies in 2023, they are going to upgrade that non-standalone 5G to uh, standalone 5G. In my country also, we recently got the uh, 5G trial in 2023, this February by Te Nepal Telecom, and is also the non-standalone 5G. So another thing is 5G is expected to have high uh, uh, generated the high revenue for the telecom companies, and there was a, a company which predicted that predicted that the uh, um, revenue of 5G uh, for telecom operators will be increased by 35 percent. So it means that we will be having more than 600 million plus users with uh, 315 billion plus revenue, and another trend in 5G is. Currently, we have the trend of uh, AI uh, chatbots like ChatGPT, Google Bard, uh, Notion AI, and all. So, telecom companies will start integrating AI in 5G. Uh, that 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 will also help improve uh, the performance, user behavior, and moreover, that will be focused on the uh, uh, reliability of 5G and all. So another thing, uh, trend that we will be having about 5G in 2023 is the IoT, uh, support for IoT, AR, VR, uh, and autonomous driving and autonomous vehicles. Since the middle aging companies, uh, companies and the countries around the globe, they are investing more in this type of things. And a lot of tech giants, tech giants like Facebook, Google, they have uh, started investing in metaverse and all. So uh, the, another uh, important aspect is cyber security. Cybersecurity is both the challenge and both uh, 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 the possibility for 5G. And other thing I found was 5G messaging service. I think that currently the 5G includes data transmission rate, but uh, 5G message, uh, but still we have are, we are having the SMS uh, and voice calls in uh, in 3G or 4G service. So uh, recently in China, China Unicom has started developing a protocol for, for messaging service. So I hope that that, that would go well and we'll be having a 5G messaging service since uh, the, the companies like Apple and Google, they have uh, Apple, uh, they have invested in RCS system. So these are the, uh, uh, these are the uh, companies that will be having the impact of uh, 5G, these are the industries. So the first thing, the first uh, industry is expected to have the mobile, uh, mobile companies, mobile industry. And the other things are agriculture industry, construction and mining industry, digitized education industry, connected healthcare system, smart city. Recently, uh, I, I had been able, lucky to visit uh, two major factories in China. So one was uh, the lithium ion battery factory. It was Gangfen lithium ion factory. So the factory uh, is producing more than 12,000 tons of uh, lithium batteries by day. But the, but one thing that they are doing is automation. So uh, 5G will be uh, expected to impact on this kind of industry uh, for automation. And other company I went recently was the medical factory. All this, all the thing they do is automation in the production of the uh, goods. So these are the industry that will be going to have impact by 5G. 
so as an academician so these are some of the things i am going to sum up uh, for the research or all because the first thing is uh, network architecture so i am in this era so i am my my research topic is based on efficient antenna selection for 5g systems based on massive memo so currently if you buy the smartphones and if you if you go to this go through the specifications you will find the uh, uh, the, the term that memo 4x4 or memo 2x2 so that basically focuses on improving the network performance so with if if uh, students or academicians who choose network architecture there are numerous uh, topics they can go through so that will basically help they help optimizing network performance another topic is security and privacy uh, so with the, with that topic we can go through developing security solutions the other, other one is iot so with the help of 5g we, we can uh, go through the era of uh, developing more enhanced iot capable capable devices and protocols and all so other is ai since ai is now uh, as a chatbot so maybe we can we can use ai for imp improving the user performance user behavior and all so i i choose this uh, 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 quote uh, because you know currently everything goes behind uh, behind the background uh, behind the uh, back end is like it's just like a magic when we were kids we used to see some magic so now technology is, uh, itself feels like a magic even the 5g things the uh, innovations we are having everything feels like a magic so any sufficiently advanced technology is indispensable for magic. So I think the the magic is on and will be getting more magic in the coming future with the development of AI, these uh, communications, uh, everything is going to get a new paradigm. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Niras. Uh, finally, uh, let's welcome our last speaker today, uh, Minu Pradhan. Welcome, Minu. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so much uh, has been uh, discussed and uh, our story from Nepal is not different from Pakistan for 5G, I guess. And uh, why this 5G is needed, uh, we don't have to tell that the technology has developed and uh, more or less uh, Nepal or Pakistan uh, will not be, uh, cannot be left behind. Uh, using this technology. Ultimately, you know, in uh, one or two years, this you know, technology will mature and uh, the, the vendors will not have uh, equipments for a 4G or they don't have spare, they will have end of service, those kind of things. So we will we will need to adopt this technology no, no matter what, no matter, matter what, and the um, bandwidth requirements from uh, our uh, uh, subscribers or industries that will require uh, for the development and but uh, there are few challenges as our uh, previous colleague have um, already highlighted so I would like to highlight more so one is choosing of frequency what frequency is um, will be suitable like in Nepal uh, we have um, more, most of our country is in mountainous region and uh, initially we need to have um, uh, sub one gigahertz uh, frequency. So, uh, and, and for uh, city areas, we need to have um, mid band uh, frequency. And one more thing, as my uh, previous uh, colleague from Encel said, is the pricing of this frequency will be the one of the key challenges. Like it, this, it, this will not, uh, you know, increase our R2 or something like this is a add-on uh, add technology which will uh, be needed to enhance our services. So I think um, the, uh, our regulatory has to be very uh, instrumental if they, we need to bring uh, our 5G technology in this country is to have a good pricing. And another is uh, another challenge will be um, our uh, you know handset penetration as we can see from our um, analysis that uh, only two to three percent uh, I think more, not not more than two percent I guess uh, is the handset penetration in Nepal uh, for 5G and uh, the affordability of uh, these handsets 
uh, these handsets and uh, and uh, as my colleague already, co colleagues have already said that uh, these are still expensive and uh, given the economy of Nepal, uh, the affordability can be a big question. And another another challenge uh, will be the our big huge investment uh, on the systems, uh, radio access networks. Uh, and now uh, our uh, like um, uh, Nepal Telecom and other two competitors have deployed. 4G network, we have not got, uh, got our investments yet back yet still, but uh, now again we have to invest on this um, new technology and depending upon uh, what architecture uh, we use, um, uh, it's non-standalone architecture or standalone, the, the investment uh, will depend on that. And uh, uh, another uh, a big challenge uh, will be the interworking with um, different vendors if we have a new a new uh, this thing and for most we need to have uh, you know a good uh, layer of um, voltage for the voice uh, traffic because uh, voice uh, for the fallback or voice over in our um, uh, uh, we, we we cannot have um, big carpet coverage of 5G network. So so for for the voice, I, I we need to um, fall on uh, uh, voice over LT or uh, or uh, you know uh, this voice over uh, uh, CS voice, but CS voice will not be supported. So those kind of things are there. And another um, uh, is um, one of the challenges uh, we need to. Yeah, we will have is uh, handset onboarding. Handset onboarding is one of, uh, you know, from the voltage um, part of it, uh, what we have just, uh, as, as my, my, our colleague, my, uh, colleague Nires, uh, has said that uh, we have this, uh, do, uh, we are doing the trials and what we find is one of, one of, one of the challenges uh, in working with two vendors and another is um, handset onboarding. It's not like you know you just bring the um, set and it works, but uh, you we need to really be close coordination with the handset vendors and for the um, uh, onboarding of the sets. And another challenge we have is uh, like our Pakistani colleague said is the uh, backbone network. Like you cannot just uh, have. Uh, microwave networks and, uh, and dreaming of uh, launching our 5G. Uh, like uh, even if uh, we are, uh, even with 4G, it's a big challenge to launch 4G on the microwave because it consumes lots of data network, uh, lots of um, bandwidth. So uh, fiber, fiberization of network uh, will be the one, one of the big challenges uh, in countries like Nepal with High mountain mountainous region where our most of our uh, sites are connected with microwaves. Uh, so I think, uh, in conclusion, I think uh, we need, need to wait and watch for the more mature network, like learning from other countries, and uh, even in Nepal, you know, um, uh, we have to wait for uh, to price to be uh, affordable for uh, operators as well as uh, handset price, affordable handset price for the consumers and use cases like uh, our uh, colleagues have said, like uh, only, not, not only EMBB uh, or uh, FWA, one of the, one of the um, immediate um, use cases, FWA can be there, but still the handsets are not, not very affordable. So we have to wait and watch to implement our um, 5G network. Uh, first of all, I think uh, our um, policies have to be in line with uh, for the deployment of 5G network uh, and lots of governments um, help on uh, uh, making uh, the frequency and import um, uh, taxes uh, more. Uh, 
uh, relaxing or uh, even uh, our colleague from uh, Pakistan says free for um, uh, 5G network to uh, be deployed. I think uh, my, my conclusion is that. Thank you so much. What a great way to conclude this portion of the event and open the floor for discussion. I think we can agree that 5G technologies set to revolutionize the way we connect with each other, learn, and do business. Therefore, the main gateway for consumers to dive into the new digital era must be the most accessible, affordable, and readily available device for all, the smartphone. As one of the leading smartphone makers uh, and 5G pioneers, Vivo has designed a wide range of products that are ready for next generation of connectivity and cater to different consumers' preferences and budgets. Our aim is to empower all our customers to thrive in the new digital world. With that, the main topic of our discussion today revolves around one central question. How can 5G technology make a real difference in our daily lives and contribute to the revitalization of society. Mohammed, welcome your thoughts. Sorry, um, uh, the point that, uh, uh, can you repeat your question because your voice was a uh, little bit. Yeah, so this is uh, about like how the 5G can uh, uh, like uh, contribute to our society and, uh, and our revitalization of our society. Like I think uh, um, a couple of my colleagues, I think uh, I'll take a cue from what uh, Asif has said early that uh, it's, it's more of a overall ecosystem development. So what is more important for 5G uh, is that, uh, first of all, what are the use cases for a specific market that you wanted to drive? And uh, those needs to be commercially viable. Um, in context of Nepal, what you see in this particular scenario is that uh, it's a country which is uh, landlocked, um, and a lot of you know uh, uh, people are actually deprived of basically the basic facilities. Also, there are areas where you need to do a two days or three days hike to even somebody to bring it to the hospital. So, while commercially it may not be viable in the initial stages, there are certain areas where five G can leapfrog. Uh, those mass infrastructure de deployment needs, which otherwise would, would take ages and years to, to deploy. For example, in case of Nepal, um, even with 4G, uh, we are partnering with certain uh, NGOs and health organizations where we are trying to do remote uh, uh, diagnostics and, and trying to provide them a central repository where these things can be actually stored and, and a kind of AI can be put on top of it. So while the basic set of connectivity uh, is helping to start with those uh, use cases, it is very prudent and it's very evident that 5G will also be playing a lot of role because still the physical environment of uh, doing a lot of things around uh, those development is something that needs to be done. Second thing itself is, uh, as we said that, uh, uh, it's a landlocked country, 45% of, or 40% to 45% is mountains, uh, fibers are not feasible, people can't afford it. Education is something that government has an agenda to drive, and this is where uh, we as operator together with the society can contribute. And uh, with the massive need of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the education, health, as well as the government sector, uh, probably a stage where uh, this evolution needs to happen from 4G to 5G to support those data needs. So yes, 5G has um, uh, a remarkable role to play and uh, contrary to what happened at 4G time, uh, my personal view is that uh, if uh, the government as well as the, uh, the private sector, they come hand in hand, make uh, good policies, just like a couple of my colleagues are talking about that, how the spectrum auctions needs to happen, what should be the pricing strategy and how exactly we wanted to adopt it. Definitely, it would play a bigger role for developing nations and countries rather than developed nations. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mohamed. So, Pervez, uh, what do you think? Well, more or less the same that uh, 5G does have uh, uh, its benefits and uh, uh, we have to go along with the, with the rest of the world, if nothing else. Uh, but uh, for, for countries like Pakistan, for example, the uh, the um, massive IoT, I think, is is a, is one one uh, killer application that we need. Uh, not only in uh, in agriculture, where we can have uh, improved uh, automatic watering uh, 
uh, uh, systems in place uh, using IoT, uh, using massive IoT. Uh, Pakistan is a it is is a water stressed country, and it's going to get worse as we as we go along. Uh, then similarly, uh, livestock monitoring on, on a massive scale, and uh, then of course healthcare. Uh, 5G uh, affords us the possibility of providing. Uh, a, a massive uh, uh, the healthcare on, on a mass scale, which uh, which no other technology can 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 offer, and uh, of course disaster recovery and uh, and emergencies emergency medical services. Again, uh, we have uh, sometimes uh, uh, these uh, uh, massive earthquakes, uh, which uh, um, cause a lot of damage in the uh, in the mountainous areas, which are not accessible. Uh, uh, somehow, and uh, also in the plains, we have floods. For example, the, the uh, last year we had we had massive floods all over the country, uh, not just uh, in the north or south. So uh, all these uh, things can uh, I- IoT has got uh, has a, has got a big role to play, especially uh, massive IoT. And uh, I think um, uh, not just uh, uh, that, but uh, smart education. Now, for example, with the, with the, with with three D visualization, we can we can teach the the kids uh, many things which uh, presently uh, they don't even understand, and they try to memorize things. Um, uh, of course, this will require a lot of investment on the on the on the uh, school side, uh, but that is at least it becomes feasible. It it becomes doable if uh, once we have uh, something like five G. So it it certainly adds uh, to uh, to to the uh, to the efforts that can be made uh, towards education, agriculture, healthcare, all important uh, 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 domains of the economy uh, in a country like Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very very much. And next, uh, let's welcome uh, views from Asif. The uh, economic benefits of 5G uh, and data are well known. There was a report some time ago by, I think, Capgemini and uh, GSMA that talked about every 10 percentage points increase in data penetration has a corresponding 1% to 2% impact on GDP. Uh, Data penetration in our country is still only at 50%. If we can get our data penetration up to 30%, that would be almost 4 to 5% increase in GDP. And right now, our country is struggling economically. Focusing on data and 4G and 5G can add billions to our economy. So uh, the entrepreneurs behind us are there in order to use the data. They need the customer base behind them. So I don't think um, the debate is around, should 5G arrive, should 5G not arrive? I think the debate has to be around a much broader vision of how do you take a country forward and generate new revenue streams that previously did not exist? What came first? Was it social media or was it 4G? And of course, the idea was the technology enabling platform will arrive that will then fuel entrepreneurs and innovators to be able to leverage that platform. So uh, again, it's a, catch-22 situation, really. If you build it, I believe they will come. But in fact, I am to build it. I need to have an economically viable model to be able to build it. Thank you. So next, uh, Khalid, would you please uh, share your opinion? Uh, Yeah, thank you. Um, I I think I agree with uh, Asif, actually. Uh, You know, when 4G didn't happen, actually, and we were just talking about application that would come in faster video, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and when it came, uh, it transformed the entire transportation sector. Uh, we had these Uber, Kareem, and everything came in. Uh, so I'm a great pro- proponent of, you know, uh, uh, providing the uh, expressways, uh, and I call 5G the expressway, uh, so that, you know, uh, the innovation innovators could come up with a different application. I foresee, you know, if there was 5G and uh, it had happened three, four years back, we would all not be sitting here and uh, doing a video call, but rather we would be walking into a virtual uh, conference room 
uh, to have a you know life kind of a discussion uh, where you could feel and uh, touch each other maybe so uh, you know uh, we need to uh, have the enabling environment uh, you know to uh, have the technology there and then all these application would fall in uh, there would be improvement on the existing applications uh, so all this would happen actually uh, and, and i agree that you know we need to have the uh, networks there uh, and there are lots of innovative people innovative companies uh, in this region uh, in nepal maybe in sri lanka india pakistan and the next google uh, and those companies could probably come in from this region uh so i i personally believe uh, that if we uh, do a good job in uh, regulatory environment we we try and help the operators to put on the networks uh the uh, the it community and i am part of that would come in with those kind of applications uh, that are not even thought of actually or is still I, i still believe you know this like uh, i used to when i was small i used to uh, see star trek uh and uh, that uh, phenomenon is uh, going to happen very soon or maybe it's already here uh so we need to have those uh, you know uh, infrastructure and all those policies in place and uh, have the uh, mnos to uh, do their job and uh, we as an it uh, companies uh, would come in with those kind of applications so my one pence there thank you thank you and neeraj uh, welcome your remarks on uh... this question yeah so so i think many things have been called or covered already so to sum up so you know 5g aims to revolutionize like the way we interact with uh, we digital world we how we live and how or how we work so in country uh, like nepal so where i belong to uh, there are many challenges from traveling so especially when it's the capital based city so everything is based in the capital city like kathmandu so we have a, a difficult demography and it's hard to travel physically so when i was preparing my uh, public service exam so i had to come to the capital city just to take the class so i had to uh, get the rent uh, rent for 3 or 4 months and prepare for the exams and then go back to my hometown and then again prepare for my study and then go back to other city to give my examination so 5g uh, our communications you know a better network connection is aim to benefit in two factors in my country one is the education industry so during the covid we have learned that uh, the distance learning our e learning platforms are growing in nepal so so it's going to benefit the entire populations from far western nepal to east uh, eastern part of nepal so other 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 uh, industry is the healthcare industry so uh, in in our country uh, we have challenges of hospitals and good manpower uh, so many people they don't want to go to the far western areas like karnali and all so maybe you know using 5g and cell connections so we may not be able to uh, uh, go everywhere physically but we may be able to get uh, support uh, from the virtual world so this is how we interact with this world so 5g is expected to enhance our life in two ways so first thing is education and the second one is the healthcare industry in my country thank you thank you all for the insights what an exciting time for the reason all right now it's time to open the floor to questions from media first let's welcome amir atta founder of pro pakistani amir let's start with your question okay thank you uh, so first of all i would like to thank uh, all of the speakers a very insightful conversation i uh, really appreciate your thoughts and opinion but as an observer i must say that uh, you know and if i'm allowed to be honest and frank uh, the the outlook seems pretty bleak uh, uh, considering the prerequisites that we need uh, for the 5g rollout in in pakistan or in nepal for that matter so uh, i hope this this situation gets better with the time uh, and and uh, not only that but you know also because this is something that is essential for the for the betterment of the technology and the, all the other you know businesses that rely on internet uh, so my question is for mr asif uh, and uh, uh, question is you know considering the uh, the lack of market specific use cases and affordability of handsets uh, uh, 5g handsets and other challenges that you have specified what are the bare minimum uh you know set of uh, <clears throat> things that government must do uh 
for you to make 50 rollout a good business case or or worthy consideration by you and other operators in pakistan and if you could just you know add one uh, small bit if government meets all these things that you might be specifying here is there a timeline that you can share uh, for a pakistani user to expect 5g in pakistan thank you amir uh, thank you for the question first and foremost uh, has to make the spectrum available to us uh, we need a spectrum policy which doesn't exist right now so that would be the first and foremost second the pricing of that spectrum has to be agreed at the moment the pricing is too restrictive i will need a lot of spectrum today we have something like 48 megahertz of spectrum and that's very expensive i would need at least 80 megahertz of further spectrum so a pricing policy has to be agreed with what should it be my advice and recommendation right now is to have a free spectrum available to the operators so that we can actually start deploying and trialing services in some of the largest cities in order to move forward we can do that to give you a time frame it would still take at least 12 months in order to get that all up and running um, but definitely there could be but with import restrictions and taxation on the imports as well it would make it economically unviable in order to allow the innovators to come in and deploy uh, medical surgeries to be able to deploy any form of um, smart city solution and then i think the government would have to work with us in order to build the relevant use cases which i think would have to be a public private partnership in order to get this moving the proposition for 5g cannot be uh, as the uh, it was said earlier on i can now download 1 giga or i can download 800 megabits that that's not it what most people need the amount of 4g spectrum we have caters for most of that to cater for the next we need to actually work with the government in order to build um a friendlier policies to enable these services thank you mr asif uh, am i allowed to ask another question uh, yes please okay thank you so my next question is uh, is for mr parvez um, you know as we all have you know very extensively discussed the challenges that uh, are there for us in order to see 5g in 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 developing markets but uh, what are the probably you know uh, some lessons that we could learn from uh, from uh, markets or from countries where 5g is already lot rolled out there must be you know some similar sort of challenges in those markets as well how did they overcome those challenges and what are the uh, other you know uh, learnings that we could probably acquire for them thank you sir uh thank you well uh, we can learn lessons from other countries no doubt uh, we can also learn lessons from our own previous uh, efforts and ventures uh, for example we were late in deploying 3g and uh, unfortunately there has not been any study as to what economic losses did we suffer because of that because we were at least 6 to 8 years late uh, but uh, the fact is that uh, considering uh, 3g and 4g and now 5g uh, are uh, benefiting the country economically if you do not have that conversely then you are at least losing something so uh, by not doing that we lose uh, we lose it and so this is a lesson we should learn uh, and uh, the government should not delay too much the uh, some of the very genuine um, uh, demands of the industry uh, in order to in order for the industry to roll out the next technology uh, from some other countries also yes unfortunately we are uh, we are in a in a very unique situation right now as you probably know all of you must be reading in the newspapers and seeing it on television we are passing through a, a period where we are uh, unfortunately politically and economically embroiled in a in a in a in a in a very odd very awkward situation and uh, maybe the lessons of the other countries uh, uh are, are may not be exactly relevant here especially look at uh, uh look at the um, 
some of the some of the things that we are we have got into gotten into now i'm being specific about the industry uh, spectrum price i mean we have been charging spectrum uh, uh, or, or pegging the spectrum price to dollars even if it is paid in rupees uh, now nobody knows how to get out of that uh, uh, it it is a, it is a typical problem in a in a in a country like ours and most third world countries i am i'm afraid that uh, if you do something uh, to change that uh, uh, it is considered to be a favor to the industry and it may be linked to some underhand or under the table dealings that is what the perception is i'm saying so, uh, so nobody knows how to get out of uh, how to delink it from from the dollar or nobody knows how to bring a new base price for the spectrum auction where a spectrum auction where the spectrum auction base prices have been set for the last what uh, 2004 was the first auction so for the last 20 years now almost so, uh, so these are some of the things where you where you get stuck and our friends in the government and uh, the regulator uh, in the, some of their off guarded moments accept that what what is being what is being demanded is 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 uh, is fair but it's difficult to to come out of it so we need some drastic uh, 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 revolutionary kind of uh, uh, kind of things in this uh, otherwise it is uh, extremely difficult uh, to to compare ourselves with our with our neighbors for example uh, then of course there is a lastly I, I must mention the problem of fiber penetration. Now, the fiber penetration, because of the right of way issues and some other and and taxes and other issues, uh, the fiber penetration is extremely low, as we uh, talked in the presentation also. Uh, and if even if we start today in trying to increase the fiber penetration and lay a massive amount of fibers, everything is uh, if everything becomes uh, extremely lucrative. For the fiber operators to do that, it takes years. It takes years to you know to 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 dig and lay the fibers and 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 start using them. So uh, these are the some of the challenges which are which may not be very unique to Pakistan, but certainly they are quite quite unique to Pakistan. And uh, of course, somehow we have to find the solutions. Nobody else will do it for us. Thank you. Thanks, thanks both. Uh, next, uh, let's welcome Arpana Magar, uh, Senior Correspondent from Tekpana. Uh, Arpana, please go ahead with your questions. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, well, my first question goes to uh, Muhammad Adil, sir. Um, so due to geographical barriers, we are already struggling to provide 4G services in all areas of Nepal. So in this scenario, um, I want to know what will be the feasibility of uh, 5G in a country like Nepal? I think a uh, very good question. So first of all, uh, let's uh, decode this into two areas. And I think my previous colleagues have already re-emphasized a lot on uh, fiberization of the sites uh, because fundamentally that's that's the, the fuel, the highway that is required to basically uh, uh, feed the, uh, the data requirements. I think uh, uh, from that particular perspective, I just wanted to put some statistics onto the table. Uh, first is, uh, uh, despite all the challenges and being in Himalaya, uh, at this date standing, we are talking about more than 88% of population uh, covered with 4G. Uh, the second stat says that from a preparation of 5G perspective, uh, the numbers are a little bit good, at least for us in Ansel, our 44% of the sites are fiberized already. So. All the urban plus suburban sites are 100% on fiber. And this is a journey that we have embarked in the last three years. So now when you talked about uh, the penetration of 5G, the, the million dollar questions actually lies on three things. First itself is, and I think my colleagues uh, from the, uh, uh, the industry have uh, re-emphasized it. And I'm reiterating that fact that uh, spectrum is the key to fuel all these requirements. And it is uh, very, uh, you know, prudent with the requirements that spectrum needs to be auctioned, uh, considering the growth of digital uh, era, rather than making money out of it. That's the point number one. So, uh, looking at whatever the situation is, spectrum is becoming totally unaffordable for most of the emerging operators, which are uh, doing in a sub 
two or sub one dollar kind of ARPU environments, unlike uh, the other areas where it is perfectly affordable and people can pay for it. The second uh, part of it is that when we talked about Nepal being landlocked, um, still uh, due to infrastructure challenges, uh, the cost of deploying a site in downtown Kathmandu or any uh, city compared to what we do in uh, mid hills, for example, or mountains is four to five times. And especially those people in terms of uh, the uh, affordability are one half or one third of what actually one people can afford in Kathmandu. So that implies uh, that there has to be special focus from the government, uh, especially to release the uh, rural telecom development firms, which is what RTDF is called in Nepal, uh, to really fuel that particular part so that we will be able to do that. The third part, which is uh, obviously, uh, and I think it's a catch-22 situation, as one of my colleagues uh, mentioned, that whether the 5G has to come first or economic benefits have to come first. So I think uh, that question, uh, uh, again, uh, is, is uh, a scenario. And we are into a pretty unique situation that looking at whatever the spectrum has been allocated to us, we're going to get into a choking situation by end of next year. So uh, one way is that if uh, uh, we get the spectrum in a right pricing uh, with the deployment cost understood and uh, uh, government supporting on USF, specifically around the areas uh, where it's not feasible to deploy uh, you know, massive uh, rollouts, then 5G would be the one that we will do that. Otherwise, the problem with our uh, industry is that uh, like in Pakistan also, and in this case in Nepal also, that we all have adopted the technologies very late. And usually an evolution of one phase is where an operator or uh, uh, any people who are launching these services to make money is 10 years, roughly, in any part of the world. So you do the mathematics, we launched 4G in 2018, and uh, within five years, the government is expecting that we should have a 5G launch happening where the market itself is not ready. So uh, yes, the relevance is there, uh, but obviously these three factors needs to be triangulated to, to really get to a situation where uh, 5G could be a viable option uh, from a perspective of uh, you know usage, from a perspective of driving the economy and digital growth. And fundamentally, which we all are believing and we have seen uh, a lot of cases and in fact, in a couple of other markets where we are operating it as a part of a group, we have seen that 5G is positively contributing to the economy of that country as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, well, I'll, uh, I would like to also ask a question to uh, Neeraj Bisal, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, so 5G technology is expected to you know, create a, a disruption. So um, I want you to explain like what could be the possible opportunities and uses of 5G network in a country like Nepal? Yeah, so still the country like Nepal, we're still, we are still struggling to get a good data connectivity, yeah. good for the, you know, yeah. when you travel to cities out, uh, you know, go, go to rural areas. So you will be, it will be hard to get a good internet connection and it is it's still hard to get, uh, you know, good 2G, 2G connection also. So having 5G will be beneficial for numerous ways, you know, so currently the crisis is going on globally and all. So 5G, uh, it seems to be benefiting in the economy of our country. We may, we can attract uh, digital nomads around the world because in Nepal, we have a good uh, infrastructure and good uh, environment that can support the digital nomads. If you see the cities uh, around Pokhara and if you can see the places around Pokhara, Pokhara uh, like Dhampus area and other areas, we have many places that can be more uh, suitable for the digital nomads. So Nepal can be a good city for digital nomads. If you, if you can give a good connectivity, good connection solutions, we can attack them. Secondly, so we can attract all the tech giants companies. So currently, so 5G is all about you know, interacting with the digital world. Everything is going digital and the cloud infrastructures and all. So we can attract uh, the, digital, uh, the tech giants around the globe, like Amazon and all. Since we have uh, Nepal is one of the major contributors in using cloud infrastructures uh, for Amazon and Google. So we can attract them. So since we already have the good uh, geography for the, that kind of solution, so maybe we can attract the tech science company to establish uh, those cloud uh, cloud solutions in our country. So which is going to be benefit for the country's economy itself. So uh, the third part, the consumer itself. So maybe these are the different things that uh, we can get benefit from the 5G. 
Thanks for great questions and answers. Next up is uh, Rizwana Omar uh, from Phone World. Rizwana, please share your questions. Okay, so before I ask my question, I just wanted to express my appreciation for all the speakers and Vivo for such an insightful session. Uh, my first question is to Mr. Khalid. Um, after the emergence of 3G, 4G, we saw tremendous growth in online services like e-commerce, ride hailing services, delivery services. So everything changed after the advent of 3G, 4G. So what similar opportunities do you think 5G will create in Pakistan? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question, uh, Rizwana. Uh, I think <clears throat> uh, when 3G, 4G had not come, we had not visualized, uh, you know, we were just thinking, uh, you know, that there would be faster video than we would see television on our uh, mobiles, uh, which happened also. Uh, but then uh, when there were more data speed, we saw that the entire transportation sector uh, was you know uh, uh, you know uh, re evolved actually and we saw Uber Kareem and all those services and so were the cases the fintech companies came in and everything came in uh, similar would be the case in uh, you know 5G uh, there would be these uh, transformation of uh, other industries uh, not the mobile industry itself although it will do that. But uh, as uh, Parvez said earlier that the agriculture sector would have a boost uh, there, we would have massive kind of uh, IoT uh, devices uh, uh, playing their role in agriculture. Uh, then education, we have, I think, 40 million uh, kids out of school uh, that could, you know, play a major role there. Uh, and then uh, other kind of services that would come in. Uh, there would be new industries as well that would be created, uh, you know, uh, and that would basically because Pakistan, uh, we, uh, I come from a, a community uh, where we interact with a lot of IT people and they have the applications uh, that they are working on, uh, but those applications they are making for probably the, uh, the developed markets uh, because they don't foresee 5G coming in and, uh, you know, uh, they are doing it for them. But once they do make those applications, when the products are ready uh, and 5G is there, uh, then we would see those kind of uh, products itself coming into the market. Uh, so uh, there would be interesting times coming up. Uh, we would see uh, things that we would, you know, at one point in time, as I said uh, earlier as well, uh, things that, uh, you know, in my age, and I don't know if you are all young, uh, we used to uh, see Star Trek and, uh, you know, there would be uh, these people <laughs> uh, coming into room virtually and talking to each other. So those kind of application, uh, we are, uh, you know, in this region, the entire region I'm talking about, not only in Pakistan, but India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, uh, uh, Thailand, all these countries, uh, they are very innovative people. Uh, you know, once we provide them the, uh, you know, uh, the kind of uh, expressways that we are talking here as 5G, the, the kind of devices, there would be new devices also probably. Uh, and I would also see maybe Vivo, not only a uh, uh, handset manufacturer, but they would go into other devices and they are actually probably, uh, and Rakesh could uh, dwell yes. more on those <laughs> things. Uh, so those kind of application would come in. Uh, kick in. So uh, the, the, the future is going to be uh, much brighter, uh, much, uh, uh, I'm, I'm more optimistic actually, <laughs> because if we have to move, uh, technology is the way to move forward uh, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, leapfrogging uh, on most of the things that we today feel very depressed about. Uh, but I think once technology is there, uh, things is going to start rolling out uh, and application are going to come in. Thank you very much. Thank you. So my next question is to Mr. Asif Aziz. Uh, 5G is obviously the way forward, although we are in a difficult situation right now, our country and the telcos at the same time. So what strategies do you think telcos should employ to start preparing for 5G? So I think uh, first and foremost, we need to fiberize more of our network. Uh, at the moment, it's about 10 or 11 percent of the network is on fiber. So that's first. Second thing, uh, we do need to focus on the applications that will sit on top of the 5G services, such as uh, the more advanced messaging platforms, the ability to provide um, remote uh, 3D printing, 
the ability to provide um, uh, much more enhanced connectivity. And I think a lot of this come, will come into the enterprise market in the B2B arena. So we need to be working with our higher end uh, enterprise customers in order to automate their factories with IoT devices. So there could be a lot more robotic manufacturing and ease of manufacturing in their processes. So understanding our customers' value chain and where technology can then enhance their value chain is I think where we will begin. I would love to say that there is a consumer proposition for 5G, but I would be lying. With only 1% handset penetration of 5G, speed will not be that reason. And, and I think we've alluded to science fiction and what possibility science fiction can bring us. In all honesty, the applications that were proliferized in the mid 2000s did not exist before the 3G auctions that took place in Western markets. And in some of the Western markets, 3G first launched in 2003 and 2004. There was no um, Facebook, there was no Skype, there was no YouTube. So the applications didn't exist, they came afterwards. So I'm a firm believer of build it and they will come. And I'm a firm believer of innovation finds a way. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, now uh, it's time for uh, last two questions. Uh, let's welcome Vedras Pokhrel, uh, the city of uh, Texati. Okay, thank you so much everyone. Thank you so much for the participation also. My, most of the queries are already resolved, but I have some queries to the, first of all, to the Muhammad Adil, sir. Uh, we have uh, like already discussed that 4G is launched in Nepal in 2018, but uh, we are talking about the 5G in the recent time also. What is the recent status of 4G in the Nepal and how can we ensure about everyone will get benefit of the 5G regardless of the geographical, geographical hundreds and like, our AIPO is sufficient to handle the 5G in the remote areas of the Nepal or the hilly area of the Nepal? Okay, um, thank you so much for your question. Again, uh, let me reiterate again uh, on the fact that when we talked about 4G itself uh, being a late entrant starting in 2018, uh, still the amount of spectrum that has been released uh, for 4G on number one end is, is not enough, uh, obviously. And there's no point in keeping that spectrum, you know, available with regulator, doing nothing and not benefiting any consumer. Uh, the second point that I'm uh, highlighting about 4G itself is that uh, uh, second thing is the usage evolution as well. I think in my initial presentation, I've shared you the, the, the data of the actual usage that is happening across the users of Nepal. Uh, around 60% of the people are doing, uh, you know, streamings on applications like uh, YouTube, TikTok, on a small screen that requires otherwise a maximum resolution of 480p to 720p. And we all know doing this means uh, the maximum speed that you need is two to three Mbps, which implies that in most of the cases, you would be sufficiently handling uh, all these requirements at this point of time now using 4G. But the challenge that we are seeing across is, and I think uh, uh, some of our colleagues have already talked about it, is that what are the added advantages of bringing 5G into the equation? First is, it is a more cheaper source of data. And, and when people say cheaper source of data, I always put this uh, statement with a caveat that this is only cheaper provided the entire ecosystem uh, goes in the direction to, to offer this. For example, uh, uh, when 5G early adoptions happen and people started deploying uh, 5G using uh, 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 different bands, uh, in case of FWA, the handsets, are the, the, the CP was uh, north of $1,000, whereas the handsets also were very high-end handsets that were causing more than eight to $900. Now, in the perspective of our market, I mean, these two are very prohibitive entrants where 90% of the people are earning this much amount of money as a capita income for the entire year. So I think that's where uh, what we are always saying is that first reaping the full benefits of 4G and at the same time seeing the possibility of putting 5G is uh, the main concern. So as we see, as we speak as of now, um, the adoptions are happening, but really those adoptions are like we talked about uh, those in, uh, 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 in early stages as well that 
you don't need a, a rocket science or, or, or a 5G to, to have a faster video, for example, on, on a smaller screen. It doesn't make any difference whether you do a 4K or a full HD screen because your handsets does not support that particular thing itself. So I think the, the main um, um, uh, evolution, if you talked about in perspective of Nepal, would be that we need to make sure uh, affordability of uh, deploying 4G more. As we said that, for example, 90% of the population is covered, but still some of those populations require low band spectrum, which is very scarce. And we are offering a pretty basic 4G service in those areas. So uh, the other point is if we have to go and densify using mid band spectrums, we need to put three sites to, to serve uh, the coverage of one single site, which is not feasible at all. So answering your question, uh, 4G is something that uh, would be uh, a mass deployment uh, coming for the you know, next four or five years. I don't think even if a deployment of 5G happens with the affordability, with the prohibitive cost, uh, with the inflation, with the exchange rates and everything happening around, 5G will be confined more into the pockets where uh, more affordability, more use cases uh, will uh, be uh, you know, feasible for deploying those 5G. So it's, it's a very long runway. Unfortunately, not a good uh, statement I should give. I should be talking positive, but uh, that's the fact around uh, what is happening and what should happen in the near future. Hope I've answered your question. Yeah, we should accept the bitter fact yeah. like easily. But like it's a bitter fact and we should accept it. Okay, like my next question to the New Year's was also, uh, what are the advantages of the cost consumer in Nepal in terms of the faster internet speed and enhanced connectivity through the 5G technology of uh, in the country? Like what we can expect, uh, how the user will get the benefit? Because like already there are uh, so much uh, population which is uh, back out, like uh, which is like back from the internet. But what the, the get the benefit if the 5G uh, is deployed in the Nepal in the context of the like... Uh, user in the context of faster internet speed and the internet connectivity so to answer you know uh thank you for the question but to answer you so we still we are still struggling with a better 4g internet service when you travel uh, to the hilly areas of nepal you it is hard for you to find the good internet connections so not the not not only 5g but i think the, the major focus will should be on deploying the better internet service like 4g even the more stable 4g so uh, consumer consumer have numerous benefit like you know uh, currently the the many, the many industries we are growing in nepal is the fintech industry the, uh, the other pla platforms like the e learning platforms uh, and e health services you know apps like hamra patro and all and the rise of apps like ambition guru and other apps so they have been focusing on giving you like e learning platforms and health service platform so having a better connectivity definitely improves the lives definitely will ease the life of the people but just not 5g so i think instead of jumping uh soon uh, for, for 5g the country country like nepal should be focusing more on a better internet connectivity more affordable 4g service uh, still we don't have uh, 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 like uh, you know like nepal recently launched Volte, nepal telecom and they both learned the Volte service in nepal but still, they are not uh, compatible with all the answers available, you know. So still, still we are uh, struggling with the compatibility of the devices and all. So having a, a better 5G or better 4G connection in Nepal will definitely uh, enhance the industry. We have currently the TikTok and all social media platforms growing. We'll be having the more uh, better influencer marketing. And also, you know, so recently Nepal had been uh, doing really great in the gaming industry. So if you will have a good uh, internet connectivity uh, with good, good latency and all, so it will definitely uh, help our gaming community to, to grow up and represent Nepal in the global community. And also, uh, I think, uh, so Nepal should not just hurry up uh, as a I saw some from uh, Pakistan say that uh, we should not mention a fixed state about 5G, but uh, we should make a better policy and all. So before jumping and before getting into 5G, so we should focus on the uh, more stable and compatible 4G connections. So after that, uh, obviously having a better 5G will definitely benefit all these industries in Nepal. I would like to thank our speakers and media friends here and all audiences on the streaming platform for joining us today. If you are interested to learn more about the exciting 5G and developments around the world, we welcome you to follow our social channels and stay informed about our upcoming 5G talks. To our incredible guest speakers, 
It was an honor to have you join our event. We know your time is precious and we are immensely grateful that you were able to carve out some time with us. Goodbye everyone. See you at our next talk. Let's stay connected.